All right, Luke 22, if you don't remember here, looking, starting at verse 14. Um, hope we, one of us have a Bible back there as well. Um, Kobe, Kobe, my Ava, because um, I want everybody to follow along. At least they can share. We, um, as a culture, as a nation, collectively, individually remember certain events, whether it be for sad or joyous occasions. Individually, at least, you know, with our spouse, we remember things like an anniversary, right? Rings a reminder, but also our anniversary date is a yearly reminder of the celebration of our union. My wife and I just celebrate our 11th anniversary, right? And looking forward for many, many more. I know uh, passed away Naida had an anniversary two days after ours, and they're, they're ahead of us. They're celebrating, what is it, Aida? The 17th anniversary. Wow, almost uh, 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 20 years that's coming up, so that's awesome. But we also collectively as a people remember things, right? Uh, historical events. Whether it's uh, momentous, you think of the, uh, we celebrate as a, as a country, uh, for those of us who are, are, are citizens here, we celebrate the, the 4th of July and the start of independence for the nation. Uh, although all weren't free yet, but that would be the start of, 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 of independence uh, eventually for all. And we celebrate that on the 4th of July, right? And that's a joyous, we see the fireworks and we celebrate. Blood was shed, but it still was a, uh, a, a, uh, a celebration that we collectively remember every year. But also sometimes those events that we remember are Sad events, right? Uh, think of 9-11. You just say 9-11. The first thing you think of is the tragedy that happened to the Twin Towers. Uh, one of our former um, members here that is up in uh, up north now, Kent, his birthday is 9-11. When you told me that, I was like, oh, happy birthday. But it's like still like, oh, man, that's a sobering birthday to have, right? Um, but we, we, have, we see signs like never forget, right? And every year around that time, there's videos to remember what we went through, right? That what people went through, laws that were life, so we can fight against ever having to deal with that fear again as a country, right? And we remember the unity that people had. The Passover for the Jewish people was an occasion for remembering. A huge celebration and festival remembering the most momentous event in Israel's history. Slavery for 400 years that had turned very oppressive, right? And they're calling out and moaning to God, and God hears them and raises up Moses and delivers mighty acts and wonders through plagues. And Pharaoh's stubborn, right? He hardened his heart, the Lord hardened his heart. This combined with the Lord's sovereignty of his heart hardening, and he hardened his own heart, right? And nine plagues in, Pharaoh is still, Pharaoh is still like, no, I'm not letting this people go. And then we see the most sobering plague of the angel of death, killing every firstborn. But in order to be passed over of that judgment, the Israel had to uh, slay a lamb, and they had to put blood on the doorpost, right? All the doorposts. When the angel of death would see the blood, that judgment of death would not come on those families, on that household. And not only do we have the celebration of the escape of judgment, but we have this, they have the celebration of liberation of bondage, right? It wasn't over that, right? They tried to leave and the Pharaoh's like, oh, I changed my mind. Even though his firstborn had just died, he took his, uh, his, his mightiest army after them. And the Israel is surrounded on all three sides. Can you imagine this? You got people that don't know how to fight as well, got the mightiest army in the world at your, the, the back of you, and you're surrounded, right? And you got the, the Red Sea in front of you. What in the world are we going to do? And God, with outstretched power and glory, Moses waves, and boom, the Red Sea splits and the people of God crosses the Red Sea on dry land. I don't think we grasp how crazy that is, right? Walking on dry land, water of wall on, the, uh, on this side, water of wall on this side, walking on dry land, and the Egyptian army's behind you. You get to dry land, and then again, 
the, the sea collapses and destroys the most powerful army in the world just like that. Talking about an occasion for great remembering and deliverance. That was the most significant redemption event. There's other times in, in the judges where God had saved his people, but the most significant event was that uh, that they celebrated in the Passover. Now, Jesus uses his last Passover meal with his disciples to institute a new occasion and better occasion for the people to remember. And though the Israel's Passover was glorious, this would be that much more glorious. This would be a call of remembrance, not just for his apostles, but all who put their faith in Christ until he returns. Reality is we remember a lot of things, and we have a lot of things in our calendars that call us to remember, but many of us can just struggle to regularly remember and grasp the significance of the Lord's Supper and what it means like we should. And we see in this text, as new covenant people of God, we must corporately and regularly embrace our call to remember Christ's sacrifice for us. As new covenant people of God, the church, (laughs) we must corporately and regularly embrace our call to remember Christ's sacrifice for us. So, last, uh, last week we saw the treacherous plans of Judas with the religious leaders. But we saw God's sovereignty, even in the evil of their plans, God was sovereign. He was going to use it to accomplish his redemption. And we see a a nod to that later here. We also saw the Lord's sovereignty in his preparation for the last Passover. He knew Judas was out here making treacherous plans. So he limited who knew about it, right? And he allowed, he always had this connection with his his, uh, brother in Jerusalem that had this upper room already ready for the disciples. And we saw Jesus' sovereignty in preparing this last Passover meal with his disciples. Let's look at verses 14. Now we're at the meal here. Verses 14. Well, let's just read 14 to 16. It says, And when the hour came, he reclined at table, and and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. So now that the place in Passover meal, uh, the place of the Passover meal was prepared, Jesus reclined at table with his disciples. Some of you guys are like recline at table. What do you mean recline at table? Well, the Last Supper did not look like the most famous Last Supper by Da Vinci, right? Uh, didn't look like that in a lot of ways. But one of the ways it didn't look like that is that they did not eat dinner all on one side of the table, sitting at chairs, right? In a dinner like this, um, a former dinner like this, a uh, uh, dinner like the Passover and others, you would, they would eat almost, li- almost lying in a reclined position. Um, uh, in a former dinner like this, you have attendees who would re- recline on like a couch slash pallet that would be around the table, around the room. So the host would take the center seat, the Jesus who was giving instruction, and then you would have uh, uh, the guests surrounded around this like U-shaped table. And the heads would be reclining at the, uh, towards the, uh, the table and the feet towards the wall. So everybody is able to eat like this. They're up on this, uh, on this side, and then the feet land back on that side. And it was, it's kind of, it, 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 part of me saying, man, that's pretty comfortable. Part of me is like, man, I would be super messy, <laughs> you know, me eating lamb chops and stuff like that, lying like that. But, you know, it's something that they regularly did that they're used to. You know? But Jesus opens the dinner saying, I have earnestly desired. That's talking about deeply desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Why did Jesus have such a strong, deep desire to eat this Passover with his disciples? Well, I think it's for a few reasons. Well, he says, before I suffer. Immediately, on a human level, Jesus loved his disciples. He truly loved his, even Judas, he loved his disciples. He had at least two other Passover meals with them, but just countless of, of, for, of uh, religious and formal meals and casual meals over the, over the years. 
And this would be the last meal that he would share with his friends, his closest friends, before his final suffering until he returns. Sometimes I think people forget about the humanity of Jesus here, that he, these are real relationships, that he loves. These are his brothers. Yes, he is Lord, but he is also their friend and spent a lot of close time. And before he suffers, this is his last meal. Also, as we know, the, the meal carried significant meaning. And the truth that he was about to deliver in this last meal was crucially important. Not only for them, but all those Notice he addressed them as apostles here, not just disciples, because they would be the ones who would carry out the mission and meaning and institute what this Lord's Supper is about for the church to come. So this had significant implication and reach for the whole church age to come. This is why, this is one of the reasons why Jesus in our last passage on the preparation of the meal took such, such careful and strategic preparation for this meal to ensure that the meal happened, and Judas did not alert the uh, the authorities and interrupt the meal. He kind of, he only told Peter and and, and John about it and made sure that nobody knew where it was until they were there. This Passover meal represented also a changing of focus on the Old Testament deliverance from the Egyptians to a worldwide new covenant redemption of mankind where they thought about the blood of the lambs causing the angel of death to pass over judgment over the homes of Israel. Now they would soon think of the, of the one holy true Passover lamb that would be sacrificed for the sins of it, not just his, or his people, and it would be over the whole world. And they would be safe from eternal judgment because of his one sacrifice. Another thing, Jesus also knew the significance of what this Last Supper would symbolize for the entire age of the church. This would be a regular and repeated corporate reminder of his blood that was shed for them and his body that was broken for them and his coming again. That's, uh, you know, Paul says in Corinthians in, uh, on, this, on the text of the Lord's Supper, that, we, that that's the text that we use when we do take communion, right? That we celebrate the Lord's death until he comes. Jesus makes it clear here that this would be the last time he would be eating this meal bodily with his disciples until the, and what he was referring to is the, I believe, is the marriage supper of the Lamb, when he is ushering his forever kingdom that we will enjoy with him. So there were so many weighty and significant new covenant truths that he was about to instruct on at this supper. And he had a deep desire to share this meal and this truth with his disciples before he suffered, before He was betrayed. I look at uh, verses 17 and 18 here. And he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom comes. So a traditional Passover meal culturally there would have like four cups of wine taken at different places portions of the meal. Now there's debate as which cup of uh, wine this was, the first one's the last one. Many believe it was the first cup before uh, uh, they would take immediately after the opening prayers. In any case, instead of drinking it immediately like they would do, Jesus had the cup passed around to everyone, distributed among everyone, emphasizing the communal aspect of the meal, being with one another, taking this together. This was a one another together corporate experience. We do this together as a people of God. And as gathered believers, this is a collective command and a call to remembrance that we mutually participate in. Then we see in verse 18, this is the second time in the meal already that Jesus points forward to a time that he would enjoy this fellowship uh, around this meal with his disciples. He said he will not drink of the wine until the physical manifestation of the kingdom of God arrives when he returns. And we will all enjoy that feast and drink of this wine with him. And we will reign forever with him. More on that later, but we, you know, he, he's looking forward. He's like, hey, I'm not going to drink of this wine until I drink with you, my people, in glory, in the feast of glory. So Jesus moves from setting up the stage of the Lord's Supper, the first Lord's Supper, 
to explain what the elements of the Passover meal would now mean for his disciples moving forward. Look at verses 19 and 20 with me. And he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the, the cup, after he, they had eaten, saying, This cup is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood. So Jesus would now be replacing the symbolism of the Passover with a new and greater symbolism for a greater covenant with his people. He changed the major symbolism and applied it to himself. The Passover ultimately pointed to Jesus as the ultimate Passover lamb anyway, so he has ultimate authority to make such a change. Jesus says that this unleavened bread is my body. This phrase, this is my body, has caused a lot of controversy. <laughs> a lot of faulty interpretation of what Christ meant about his presence in the, in the uh in, in the communion elements, in the Last Supper elements. Many claiming they take the literal plain reading of the text. So Roman Catholics would believe that when we take of communion, and what Jesus is talking about here is actually eating, the, that the bread and the wine literally become the body and blood of Christ. They believe that they are actually eating and drinking the flesh and blood of Christ. I know that sounds crazy, but it is what they believe. This is, you know, I'm just, he said, this is my body, right? So they take it very little, like it becomes, as they eat it, the, the, the flesh and blood of Christ. Lutherans believe that Jesus' body is present in, around, and under the rind. So it's like all around it, almost like I uh, saw somebody mention, uh, somebody mentioned like a water present in a sponge. Now, although Jesus is always with us, even in taking communion, he, lo, he is always with us even to the end of the age. He will never leave us or forsake us. I believe that the context of this Passover meal makes it very clear that Jesus is being symbolic here. So the, the historical context of the Passover, every, almost all the items were symbolic, right? The roasted lamb, for instance, made the Jewish people remember the blood of the, lamb, of the lambs on the doorpost. The bitter herbs remembered uh, their, their bitter slavery. It, was, it would have been expressly clear that when Jesus held up this bread and said, this is my body, to the disciples, they would have known that he was speaking figuratively and not that this piece of bread is my body. As one uh, commentator says, in the setting of the Passover meal, where food symbolizes historical events, the verb is is naturally underst as understood as meaning represents rather than suggesting a transformation of the bread into another substance, especially as Jesus was bodily present holding the bread. So the unleavened bread now represents the body of Jesus, which would be broken in his suffering and death. This represents his body, it says, which was given for you. That is a very significant and important phrase, given for you. We see this is a big word, but we see that vicarious nature of his body being broken, being broken. Meaning his body was given in place of, instead of, as a substitute for you. It was given for you, and that you is he's talking to the whole disciples, not just individually, but collectively you. Jesus' body was given for everyone in this room and everyone in the world. When they eat of the bread, they are to remember that Jesus' body being given and broken in our place for us. So instead of us paying for our sins, Jesus' body was broken on the cross and paid for our sins in our place. We got a few young people in here, Amaya and Maya and Kobe and Ava and some other, uh, or well, not some others now, but we have young people occasionally. Have you ever gotten in trouble at school? How many have I gotten in trouble at school before? I know, I know all of my kids have raised their hand, right? How many have had somebody say, you know what, teacher, principal, I'm going to take the punishment for you? 
And instead of you getting the suspension or in trouble, that other kid was punished for you because he volunteered to take it. Anybody ever have that happen? Maybe somebody said they, they did here. But even if it did happen, all right, rarely would that happen. Hey, I'm going to get kicked out for you. I'm going to get punished for you. I'm going to get detention. While you have fun at recess, you were bad, but I'm going to take it for you. Let's say that did happen. It would only be for you for that specific situation. Jesus, when he was our substitute, he did not just substitute for our sins, but the sins of the whole world. And it wasn't just one time, it was for forever. So Jesus is your forever substitute. Everything, all the goodness that he's done in his life was substituted for you. His death was substituted for you. His life was exchanged for yours. So when Jesus sees your perform, uh, when God sees your performance, he sees Jesus as, as a substitute. There's this, uh, this uh, movie called Cars 3. Anybody watch Cars 3? And uh, Lightning McQueen's in there, and there's like this new girl named uh, Cruz, Vic, Victor Cruz, right? And she's like, is it not Cruz? It's, what is, what's her name? Is it Carmen? No, 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 it's, the, it's Cruz, right? Wherever, it's either Carmen or Cruz, right? Um, I think it's Cruz, but I'm going to go with Cruz. It's a yellow car, and at the end of the race, or at the last race, Cruz is a trainer. And she trains cars, but she wants to be a racer. And she's training uh, old Lightning McQueen in this last race. And he starts the race off, but he decides to leave and let Cruz run the race for him. And Cruz ends up, a trainer ends up winning the race. And at the end of the, uh, the movie, we think that, you know, the Lightning McQueen lost and he has to, you know, do all this thing he would said he would do if he lost. But at the end of the, the race, it shows both Cruz and Lightning McQueen winning the race. And everyone's like, what? He didn't even finish the race. He didn't, do, he didn't run that race. He only did the first part. But they said that what Cruz did applies to Lightning McQueen. And Jesus lived a perfect life, a life that we couldn't live for our place. And his body was broken and given for us, right? It, as a substitute, nothing we have done, if we, are, uh, if we are forgiven in Christ, matters. It's paid, Jesus paid it all forever. You don't have to keep on, you know, you see these, you know, these, these sickening scenes around Easter time of these, these, uh, uh, these uh, maybe sincere people that are getting crucified as, as remembrance of what Jesus done for them. No! Jesus paid it all. It is finished. You do not have to try to make yourself suffer for sin anymore. Some of you guys sin, and you're, you, this may be you repeatedly sin, and you're guilty, feel guilty about it. You don't want to run back to Jesus. No, 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 no. Jesus took your sin. You can run to him because he paid it all. You don't have to be guilty anymore. He already took all that guilt. Run to him. He is your substitute, complete forever substitute. Then he says, do this in remembrance of me. This is the main command in all these communion texts. For disciples in the church of God, there are many insights we may be able to take away from this text. But the main emphasis, not just in this text, but in all the communion texts, the main emphasis that Jesus has is one of remembrance of what Christ has done. As we take the bread today, we must collectively remember his suffering, his body being torn for us, our sin laid on him. This is not just eat a, a, a stale cracker and, um, as a church habit and then, soap and, then, you know, and, uh, and then wait for our food to come, or real food to come. No, no, no. We soberly but, thank, but thankfully and joyfully reflect on his body that was given for our sake. He who knew no sin at all became sin for us. Through his stripes, we are healed. Jesus knows his apostles may not understand it right now. But he says, do this meal 
in remembrance of my sacrifice and suffering. And when he raises again and appeals to them, all this stuff starts, clicks and makes sense. Verse 20, Jesus goes back to the cup and says, this cup is new covenant in my blood. We know the old covenant was ratified by sacrifice and blood of animals. Moses in Exodus 24 took the blood of the sacrifice and filled the altar with it. But he also, if you remember, to ratify that, the old covenant, he actually sprinkled it on the people. And then he said, behold, the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. The blood of Christ ratifies a new covenant. The Last Supper, Jesus is signaling the end of the old covenant and the old covenant people of God and with his death and resurrection, he, tr- he transitions to the global church, which is the new covenant and new covenant people of God. The new covenant all can be part of the people of God, all right? Through faith in the person and sacrifice of Jesus. The old covenant relied on daily animal sacrifices to atone for the sins of people. Even the priests had to atone for their own sins. The new covenant required one sacrifice from the perfect Lamb of God who takes away the sins of all who believe in him. So Jesus says this cup is poured out for you. Christ's blood was poured for you. Matthew says in his his, his, uh, 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 Last Supper text says, says for the forgiveness of sins. Mark says for many. Jesus' blood was poured out for your sake. So when you drink of the cup at communion today or whenever you do it, whether you're in a church overseas, When you do that, you are remember that Christ's blood was spilled for your sake. All the Old Testament, all through the Old Testament, you have bloods of various types of animals symbolically covering the sins of people. But they point it to the ultimate sacrifice. As Hebrews tells us, the blood of bulls and goats could never take away sins, but the blood of the divine precious Lamb of God can. Not just for one person, not just for the year, But as we sang, the blood will never lose its power. Christ's blood covers you for eternity. Jesus says, drink this in remembrance of me. Jesus was the true Passover lamb, and his blood was provided covering forever. Hebrews 7.27, he he says, he has no need, like those high priests, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for the sins of people, since he did this once and for all when he offered up himself. As the mediator of a better covenant, Jesus was both the perfect priest and a sacrifice. So the priest, the perfect priest, was also the perfect sacrifice, the lamb. Right? Abraham could not replace himself with his son. But Jesus could. But God, replaced, Jesus replaced himself with us. Right? We were supposed to die. We were supposed to uh, be punished. But Jesus says, no, he was punished for us. His blood was spilt for us. One commentator says, the blood spread on the doorposts of homes, which turned away the angel of death, finds its ultimate meaning in the blood spilled on the cross, which turns away God's wrath against sinners. So remember Jesus' presses and cleansing blood that cleanses you from every stain of sin as you take communion today. Every stripe on his body was for you. Every blood that poured out from his head to his toes was for you. And, th- and this meal should cause you to soberly but joyfully reflect on Jesus' sacrifice and that this was done for you. Jesus is the ultimate Passover lamb, provides holistic liberation from not just physical boundaries of slavery. We will also be uh, 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 liberated physically, but from the spiritual boundaries of sin and its pen- penalty. Now judgment is passed over you because you are forever covered by the true and holy Passover lamb. Hallelujah, right? So as Jewish people celebrate the Passover, we have more reason to celebrate the Lord's Supper because the redemption through the Lord's sacrifice is much greater and more impactful than the redemption in Exodus. As the Jewish people never allowed their children to forget about the Passover, and they they always talked about it, not just at the Passover meal, but throughout the year, we should never allow our children and ourselves to forget about the Lord's sacrifice and what it means for them and the world. It should be repeated throughout the year in our homes, in our church, collectively, and especially during the Lord's Supper. 
Now, as Jesus is inaugurating this important institution of the Lord's Supper, and he's having this conversation, he also takes time to call out the traitor in their midst and his coming destruction. Look at verses 21 to 23 with me. But behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. For the Son of Man goes as it has been determined. But woe, anytime you hear woe, it's not a good thing, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to question one another, which of them could it be who was going to do this? Now the audacity of Judas here. He's sitting in this intimate setting with Jesus who had loved him and served him and never outed him. They still can't figure out who is Judas, right? And he's sharing his bread all while planning to hand him over to the authorities. Jesus made it expressly clear to Judas that I know who you are, that uh, 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 I know what you're, uh, you're planning to do, and you receive your just judgment for this great betrayal. Now, some people may have a problem with verse 22 and feel some type of sympathy for, from, from Judas. Look at verse 22 again. It says, For the Son of Man goes as it has been determined, but woe to that man who, by, by whom he is betrayed. So it says it has been determined, like this has been prophesied and planned by God. All right, Judas held full response, but also Judas held full responsibility for his choice to betray Jesus and was worthy of judgment. Yes, Judas, betrayal was part of God's plan, right? It was even prophesied in, in, um, in, in the Psalms. David is talking about a, a betrayer in that immediate context, but we know it points forward to, to Judas. But at the same time, God did not force Judas to sin or act against his nature. Judas acted in accordance with his nature and chose to portray the sinless son of God and would be judged severely for it. Although you were born a sinner and in sin did your mother conceive you, you bear full responsibility for your choice to sin, to live in sin, and are also worthy of judgment. Good news, you can accept the fact that the judgment that you deserve was placed completely on Jesus. All of it. You can either let Jesus take your punishment by repenting of your sin and putting your faith in Christ to save you, or you can be judged for the weight of your own sin yourself, and you do not want that. Let what Christ has already done. I know I've said this a million times, but if you are in debt a million dollars, and somebody has, has a check for your debt, not just for you to get out of debt, but to be forever be taken care of, how idiotic would it be for us to reject that? Jesus has paid it all. He has covered your judgment. It's already been placed on him. All you have to do is repent and believe, and what Christ has, been, has done is applied to you immediately and forever. Run to Jesus. Then you can joyfully reflect on this meeting. Listen, Judas, um, one thing we can learn from uh, the story of Judas is that you can be around true believers, even around Jesus, and that doesn't mean that you are a true believer in Christ. Jesus, Jesus knew who Judas was. And, uh, sorry, Judas knew who Jesus was. He knew that he was the Messiah, right? But yet he still betrayed him. You can listen, you can know all the facts about Jesus. You can know all, you can, uh, you can um, exegete the Lord's Supper and what it's meaning, and you can still die and go to hell, right? It's not about just knowing facts that Jesus died, that he rose again, that he loves you, for God so loved the world. If that's all you know in your head, you can die. Listen, you can die and go to hell. You must personally repent and believe and put your trust in what Christ has done for you. For you, you must trust Jesus to save you. It's not about just knowing Sunday school facts about what Jesus did. You must recognize that Jesus died for you and ask him to save you. And that's when what he did is applied to you. Put your dependence on Jesus. Jesus revealing of the traitor in the midst turns into a cage and a finger port. Now, I was uh, um, without a doubt here, right? And they start pointing at each other. And then it turns into some petty argument next about, I don't know how they get from here to who the greatest, right? Well, I could probably understand, right? Thinking about how my brothers and I, 
you know, uh, would, uh, you know, argue over Thanksgiving or something like that. But it turns from who betrayed Jesus to who's the greatest. But even with all that finger pointing, no one expected Judas, right? We know that even when Jesus says, go, what you do, go do it quickly, you know, it seemed like that would like out him, but they're like, oh, uh, he's probably going to turn the money in or doing something, give money to the poor or something. They're like completely oblivious. You know, you can fool the people of God, but you can't fool the Lord about the state of your soul. You know, there are so many things that we can break down about the nuances regarding the Lord's Supper. But the main command that Jesus has for his disciples and us, for our church, is to our call to remember. So I want to spend here as we close a few a- applications on, on the reflection of the Lord's Supper. Again, our chief command that Jesus gives us to his disciples, though they did not understand it, was to remember. But what are we supposed to remember as it pertains to the Lord's Supper? Let's recap a few things. One, remember that we are presently part of a better covenant a new covenant based on forgiveness of sins not, and not adherence to a law that we have no power to keep. So the new covenant is better because unlike the old covenant that was written in stone, the new covenant God says, give, gave to Jeremiah, he says that he would put the law within our hearts. All right, the new covenant is also better because the new covenant is not just a list of laws that we can't keep, that's impossible for us to keep, but the new covenant ratified by the blood of Christ In that new covenant, we have the power to keep the law. This is what a new covenant passage in Ezekiel here. Ezekiel 36, 26 to 27 says this. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. So Ezekiel lists all these aspects of the new covenant here. And people agree that we see aspects of the new covenant here are a new heart, a new spirit, the indwelling Holy Spirit, and the power for true holiness. So the Mosaic law, the old covenant, couldn't provide none of these things, right? That's why Romans 3 says there is none righteous, no, not one. But we can keep the law and we can be holy because in the new covenant, another thing about the new covenant that makes us better is that God dwells with us. He tabernacles with us, right? He lives in us through the person of the Holy Spirit. Think about this, right? God, the powerful, eternal God, omnipotent God lives in you. If you have put your faith in Jesus, God, Holy Spirit is just as, as, as God as God the Father is God, lives in in you. The power of God lives in you. You have his presence with you forever. And lastly, the new covenant we remember is better because it offers forgiveness of sins forever. Jeremiah also says, you know, uh, quotes God, he says that I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sins no more. And we see the blessed irony here that as we regularly remember what Christ has done for us, Jesus chooses to forget what he has uh, uh, what we have done against him forever. Not only do we remember the new covenant currently um, as we think about communion, but we were, uh, too, we remember the meaning and the elements of communion we take and what they represent. We remember his body that was given for us, broken for us. We should collectively think about his suffering when we take communion, his flesh being ripped apart for our sake, his face being marred more than any man's. Him being beaten. And we'll look more into this as we get to the story of the cross. But he was beaten. He had the crown of thorns nailed to his head. We should think about his, his nails being through his wrist and his feet. And we should think that that was for me. In the place of me, I escaped judgment and punishment because it, and, G, the, and Jesus endured suffering in my place. Folks, I don't think we, we don't really fully grasp this. We could be lost like many of the people that you passed this morning, that many people that you would talk through at work. We could be lost and on our way to hell 
And if we die in our sins, it would be just for us to, uh, to die in our sins. But Jesus opened your eyes where you recognize the significance of his death and you put your faith in Christ. How much should we remember his body broken for us? We shall also remember his blood. Remember the blood dripping from the crown of the thorns, being poured from his body for you. Remember that Christ's blood provided atonement for you for your sins forever. You don't have to continue to, to shed blood, your blood or the, or the blood of other animals, because Jesus, through his shedding of his own blood, paid the price for your sin forever. We should remember that because the blood uh, because uh, the blood, because when God looks at us, he doesn't see how you failed him this week. He sees the righteousness of his son because of the blood that was shed for us. He sees you through the lens of Christ. Remember that as the devil tries to get you in guilt and shame. When you go before God, Jesus, if, he will, if he's not going to deny Jesus, he's not going to deny you. Run to him. You are covered in his blood. And as we eat, as we drink of the cup, remember the power of the blood. Remember the invitation that you have because of the blood. Remember the embrace that God has of you because of the blood. Remember that he will always hold you fast because of the blood. There is power in the blood this morning. Celebrate. Hallelujah. Thank God for the blood that was shed for us. But not only that, we do not just look past, folks. Twice in this text, Jesus talks about the coming back again, right? The kingdom, the eating, eating the feast in the future. He talks about the feast and glory. We look forward to the fact that Christ is coming again and all of us will eat and drink with our Savior forever. Without the presence of sin, without injustice. And, it will be, and we, will, we will feast with him and reign with him. I don't think we grasp how glorious that occasion will be. Again, the joyous, momentous experience that you have on this earth does not compare in an inch to what it will be like in glory. Put your mind on that when you, think, when you eat of communion. I'm talking to myself as well. There's coming a day when we will enjoy that. So as we eat communion, we should look to the present that we celebrate the new covenant. We're the new covenant people of God and all the blessings in the new covenant. We should look past to his body that was broken for us, the blood that was shed for us, but we should also look to the future, that Christ is coming again and we will feast with him in glory. So church, almost done here. We should also, we should also remember that this was a collective command. This is a corporate command to remember. This would be one of the two ordinances of Christ we, that would God would give his church. So yes, we need to reflect individually, but we need to do this together. We as a body of Christ need to remember that his body was broken, that we as saints are covered in Christ's righteous blood and that was shed for us. We as covenant members of God's church should keep us accountable to remember this together right? The apostles, probably hearing this for the first time, was all confused, right? And we know they had intentional blinders on, <laughs> um, even though Jesus had repeated, talked about his suffering. So they didn't understand this. But how easy is it for us to partake of the Lord's Supper and not have our minds and hearts embraced on this meeting? How many times have you done that? How many times have I done that? We have the whole gospel story, but I think like the disciples, we can fail to grasp the significance of taking the Lord's Supper. We can treat it like some just religious thing that we tack on at the end of the service that's keeping us from our meal. I'm afraid that communion can come, sometimes just become routine and we don't sit with the weight of what Christ has done for us and what we have in Christ that is coming. Church, today, make it a matter of conviction that every time you take the Lord's Supper, you meditate and remember on what he has done and what has he, he has coming for you. Let's keep each other accountable towards that end. That's why, if, I'm just said this, some of you, I've talked to some of you guys who listen online in the community. That's why you need to be here. Because you can't take communion when you're away, right? This is part of the corporate 
gathering uh, ordinance that we do. You need, that's why you need to be here. So we can take this together, celebrating what Christ has done and what, what he's coming to do together. Jesus, through his sacrifice, has made us a new covenant people of God. Let us regularly embrace his call of remembrance of his sacrifice and his coming again as we take the Lord's Supper.